Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, your Holy Spirit is welcome here. Convict those of us that need to be convicted. Annoy those of us who need to be annoyed. Challenge those of us who need to be challenged. And comfort those of us who need to be comforted. Through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, in Christ our Lord, Amen. The last time I spoke, I encouraged you, after a book that I love, to live big and be well. And today, I want to add to that. I do think we need to love big and be well. But I also think we need to pray hard. And I think that our world could benefit from more prayer. But in order to have more prayer, we are going to need more prayers. In recent months and years, we have experienced both personal and national tragedies. And there have been times when many of us have been left without adequate words, rendered speechless, except for our prayers. And so we pray and we believe that God can bring new life from our inarticulate cries. And yet some of us will admit, Lord, there are times when I don't even know how or what to pray right now. And it is in those times that we may need to ask the Lord to teach us to pray like the disciples ask in our scripture today. On a summer vacation in 2016, I had the privilege of visiting a place where prayer is constant. And you'll see a picture of it on the screen. It's from a convent in La Crosse, Wisconsin, where the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration live and worship. Perpetual Adoration and round-the-clock prayer have been a cherished practice of theirs since August 1st, 1878. For over 140 years, continuously, day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at least two people have been praying continuously in their chapel. They do this to maintain awareness of God's presence in their lives and to keep vigil for their community, the church, and the world. Every hour on the hour, at least two people from the convent and other prayer partners spend some quiet time away from the busy world to deepen their relationship with God and to pray for the needs of others. Folks, I walked out of that chapel feeling like I had been somewhere holy and knowing deep down that I needed to do better with my own prayer life. So like the disciples, I came home and I asked the Lord, teach me to pray. And I began to examine the prayer that is so familiar to us as United Methodist. The prayer that begins, Our Father, which art in heaven. As Jeff just told the children, with the beginning of this prayer, we acknowledge that God is both personal and heavenly. God is our very real, holy parent. He is relational. He is caring. And yet he lives in heaven and he is holy and hallowed and sometimes he is mystical and intangible. And holding that balance is sometimes hard for us to understand. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven, continues blending the divine with the earthly. Frederick Buckner comments on those powerful lines, and he warns that we should not take them lightly. He writes in his book, Whistling in the Dark, when we say, thy will be done, we are asking God to be God. We are asking God to do not what we want, but what God wants. And if that were suddenly to happen, what then? What would stand and what would fall? Who would be welcomed in and who would be thrown out? You see, to speak words that say, God, be God, is to invite a tiger out of the cage, to unleash a power that makes atomic power look like a warm breeze. We can do nothing without God. We can have nothing without God. And without God, we are nothing. After Jesus taught his disciples what to say, he taught them how to say it. He says that we are to pray with perseverance. And like he often does, he tells a story about a neighbor who goes to a friend at midnight and begs for bread. And Jesus suggests that prayer is like driving for days to get to a friend's house, one that you haven't seen in a long time. And you wonder if they'll remember you and if they'll be glad to see you like you will be glad to see them because you really haven't kept in touch as you promised. And you're so excited and so anxious to give them a hug and say hello, but you don't get there until it's very late and all the lights are already out and you wonder if anyone is home as you stand in the dark. And you stand at the door and you knock. And it's hard to tell, is there movement inside? Is there any sign of stirring? It is so quiet. But there you are. You have driven so far, and you have nowhere else to go. And you can give up and go away, thinking they have given up on you. Or you can stand at the door and knock, and knock, and knock. And standing there, If you are persistent, who is to say that that friend will not answer? Jesus assures us the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Now that's reassuring. But despite that assurance, And as I recall my own life of prayer and prayers that I've heard and conversations that I've had about prayer, I can't help but wonder if the Coke machine isn't our primary teacher for our prayer lives. I first read this analogy from a pastor whose blog I follow, but I want you to think about it. When we pray, oftentimes, We think, I am putting in the correct change. We make our selection and we get what we want and it's easy peasy. For everyone who asks, receives, and who searches, finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And so we offer the coins of our wants and our needs and our beliefs and our good behavior and all that works until it doesn't. Coke machines are great until they take your money and give you a Dr. Pepper when you wanted Diet Coke. Now, I want you to think about people that you've seen and how they respond when that happens. They get mad. They push the button again and again and again. They hit or kick the machine. Some of them try to tip it side to side. 
they rage. I did my part. I put my coins in. I want the machine to do its part. And we are not so different with prayer when we don't get what we want. Some of us get angry. Some of us feel hurt or betrayed. Some of us lose faith. Some of us leave the church. And I'm not an expert. But I, I don't always understand how prayer works. But I know this. It's not about the coins. It is not a mechanical process. It is not a transaction And it's not the transmission of information to God. When we are in the midst of not knowing and not understanding, maybe the most and the best thing we can do is to echo the disciples' request. Lord, teach us to pray. We are always beginners. We are always learning how to pray. And Jesus' response is not an explanation of how prayer works or what prayer is. Jesus didn't offer us a formula. He didn't give us magic words. He didn't give us correct change for the Coke machine. Instead, as he often does, he is teaching us about who and how God is. God is our Holy Father, who art in heaven, and we, thanks be to God, are his divine children. We are holy sons and daughters. That's a given. That's a reality. Before we open our mouths, before we ever offer our coins and try to make a selection, that relationship exists. That's how Jesus began his teaching Prayer is about our relationship to God and about his presence with us. Folks, we are not giving him coins that he hasn't seen before. We're not telling him something that he doesn't know. We are instead reminding ourselves of what already is, always has been, and always will be. That relationship means that our life, our existence, our very being comes from our Father. In the model prayer, Jesus speaks of daily bread. We are too often convinced, at least I am too often convinced, that I must be independent or self-sufficient. And prayer is meant to remind us that we are not self-sufficient. We ask each day for our daily bread. That doesn't mean that we're deficient in some way. It means we recognize that our sufficiency comes not from ourselves, but from God. It means to remind us that God sustains and nourishes our life. That's another way of talking about relationship and presence. And then there's lines about forgiveness, ours and others. Again, we're talking about relationships and presence with God and with each other. Remember what Jesus said when he was asked about the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. So if prayer, if Jesus, as Jesus teaches it, is really about relationship and presence, then there's really only one answer to every prayer, God. And I don't just mean God answers our prayers, but 
God is the answer each and every time. God's presence, God's life, his love, his beauty, his generosity, his compassion, his forgiveness, his wisdom, his justice, his mercy. God gives himself as the answer to every prayer we pray. Jesus tells us that if you know how to give your children good things, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? Now, somewhere along the way, I learned to use the steps of praise, repent, ask, and yield in my prayer life along with the Lord's Prayer. Praise is where you start your prayers by acknowledging and praising God for who he is, for his attributes, and for his blessings that he has bestowed upon you. And this can include expressions of gratitude, adoration, and recognition of God's sovereignty, love, and faithfulness. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, I'm going to admit that when I started using this, I had a little trouble with the praise part because I was used to just jumping into the, here's my coins, I want what I want. So if you decide that you're going to try this model and you think, I don't really know how to pray, I don't really know how to praise, look in the Psalms. There are excellent Psalms of praise that you can use. Or look in your hymnal. I suggest starting with holy, holy, holy. The next one is repent. Confess your sins and your shortcomings to God. Seek his forgiveness and his cleansing. This step involves acknowledging areas where you have fallen short where you have failed to love and expressing genuine remorse for your actions. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then ask. Present your requests, your needs, and your desires to God. This is the part of prayer where you bring your concerns, your petitions, and your supplications before God and you trust that he will provide and give you wisdom. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation. And guys, here's where it gets good, because here you get to talk to your father on the behalf of other people. And y'all, it is a great honor to be able to pray for another person. Last, yield. Surrender your will to God's will and submit to his purpose. This step involves trusting God's and relinquishing control over your life to him. This means you acknowledge that his plans and his ways are higher and better than your own. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I've printed off some cards that has this prayer model. If you'd like one, you can pick one up out there by the donuts. Perhaps the greatest difficulty of prayer is that sometimes we still just want to offer our coins and push the button. We don't want God. We want something from God. We want God to change our circumstances. And while God can change, and sometimes does change, circumstances, I'm increasingly convinced that more often than not, 
God wants to change us. He wants to change me. God self-giving sustains and nourishes and strengthens and empowers, emboldens and enables us to face the circumstances of life. And we do so sometimes with joy and with gratitude. Other times we have to do it with pain and loss. But we do it always with God. Always with God. And on my better days, I know this, and that's enough. And I can praise and remember. And on the other days, I'm back to being a beginner again. I'm square one saying, Lord, teach me to pray. Amen.